Good afternoon. It's Andrew Ross Sorkin of the New York Times, founder of DealBook. Thank you all for joining us uh, on this Thursday for this week's DealBook debrief. And it's a special one uh, because we have a rock star joining us uh, today. Kara Swisher uh, is on the line with all of us. And I should tell you, thousands of you have joined uh, today's call. And I know so many of you have already sent questions in. And we want to encourage you to send more. Michael Delamer said, uh, veteran dealbook reporter and uh, all things tech extraordinaire is with us as well. He's going to be sorting through your questions uh, as we go through this. A quick reminder for everybody, this is an audio only call. So if you're looking for our beautiful faces, uh, you won't get to see them, uh, but you can listen in and keep, these, keep the conversation in your ears. Uh, we'll do a replay as we always do um, and make it available on nytimes.com. We'll push it out on social and we'll also make it available in tomorrow's DealBook newsletter. Uh, but of course, so much going on in the world of big tech, uh, big debates about freedom of speech issues um, in the world of social media. And we will get to all of that and more. And um, let me just start by thanking Kara and welcoming her to the call. Well, you're thanking me in advance. You don't know what's going to happen here, but go right ahead. That's that fine. is true. <laughs> that is true. I don't know what is about to happen, but but let's let's get right into it because you have you have a big column out and you have taken a very provocative uh, and strong view against Facebook, against Mark Zuckerberg, and against a lot of what he's doing right now. Yeah. Um, specifically in terms of how he has reacted to President Trump's uh, comments and posts relative to the way Jack Dorsey and uh, now um, Evan Evan Spiegel at Snap are dealing with these things. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll just let you let you let you get into it. You're, you're, well, you, you laid into him. Why? Yeah, I have done that. That's just another Wednesday for me, Andrew. Um, I've, I've been a critic for a long time. My very first Times column, which was two years ago, almost 2018, I talked about that. I had this quote that I used in the column, which is, they've weaponized social media, they've weaponized political discourse, they've weaponized society, they're amplifying very dangerous things. And it's, it's a topic I've been talking about for years and years and years uh, with them is that what is happening on that platform is, you know, people compare it to cigarettes companies, but I compare it to sort of like giving us all terrible food and having no regulation, whether it's tainted or bad for you or full of sugar or whatever, and that there are some remedies that need to be thought of because this is a completely unregulated industry. And I'm not talking, what happens is Mark tends to pull in the First Amendment and free speech and everything else in this incredibly nonsensical, convoluted way, uh, that it creates a the real focus, which should be on uh, the, their business model is designed to uh, to anger to it, it, it operates on enragement and so not all of it and some of it's great but a lot of the architecture of it is problematic and I would like them to think hard about it instead of making excuses for allowing uh, someone like Donald Trump to run rampant on it without any any impunity and so that's what I was talking about and what happens is you get dragged down into this free speech thing, and people are super reductive, have obviously never read the actual First Amendment, um, which is not about, uh, it's about government not restrict abridging uh, freedom of speech. It's not about Facebook doing it. Um, and in, let me just finish on all these arguments that Facebook uses, they always are talking about free speech, free speech, when they completely monitor that platform and do whatever they want on it all the time. And they make all kinds of editorial decisions. And so I, 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 I just don't appreciate someone going on using sort of false arguments and then doing whatever they please on the platform anyway, including taking people down. Okay, let me ask you this though. Um, I think nobody likes an authoritarian, nobody. No, um, no. We don't like it in politics. I don't think we like it in business. However, in the context of what's happening here, we have a situation where Facebook's taking one position yeah. Twitter's taking another position. Snap's taking another position. I had a conversation yesterday with, with, with Steve Ballmer, mm -hmm. a former CEO of, of Microsoft. And he said, look, I kind of actually like it that way. I like right. that there are people taking different positions because potentially in the future, it means that consumers could have choice. And he effectively raised the question, do you want one person? And as you know, and you have said in so many of your columns, that Mark Zuckerberg yes. runs that company with an iron fist. It is his and his in full. Well, that's a fact. Uh, that's not, I don't say it. It's a, he has complete control over that company from a stock point of view. And so. therefore, do we want him making all the decisions? 
but but he's not making decisions. He's not making all. He's making any private. It's a private company. It's not a public square. First, that's the first thing that I'd like to disabuse people of. They keep saying it's. I get to say whatever I want on Facebook. Actually, you don't get to say whatever you want. In lots of places. And lots of uh, lots of different places. Everyone makes decisions about their businesses. Secondly, it's not one person making a decision. What Mark has done is he's made a rule that is so hard. It's so so absolute a rule. We'll only take things down. Well, Twitter put on a fact check on it. And by the way, Facebook puts on fact checks. So does YouTube. I mean, they do these things and pretend they don't. Uh, but he makes one rule that we, we only will take it down. We will not uh, label it. We will not on Trump stuff. This is only about Trump because they do it on other things. Um, we'll, only, um, we'll only do one thing. And that makes you have no choice. You have, you have black or white choices when this is such a complex area of gray that you have to exercise some level of control of the platform. I think if this was a car, co any other kind of company, we would never allow this kind of behavior. You know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a car without a seatbelt. And you know what, maybe the tank will blow up. I don't know. Like you just, you, it, it's so, when you put it to any other industry, uh, he wraps himself around these free speech arguments when it's about the ability for them to have, to grab your data and do whatever you want, which the real heart of this is about that. Like this first amendment stuff is sort of a smoke screen for the fact that they get to do anything they want with your data. And that's where re legislators need to focus on is how they use this data, what rights they have to this data, how they abuse this data and things like that. And to me, this other stuff will take care of itself once the business model isn't quite so, uh, uh, I hate to use the term rapacious, but rapacious of people's privacy. You have effectively also called out his call outs or efforts, if you will, to say, please come regulate me. I don't <laughs> want to make these choices unto myself. I want the government. I believe the demo that, that democracy should be making these choices for me. You think that's that's bold? Well, because the, the government doing it is, is actually enshrined in the Constitution. Government shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. It's, it's right there. Like I put it in the column because I'm like, please read this because it actually says what you're supposed to do. What, what it, regulation that he needs is data protection, privacy protections, really substantive, uh, just the way we need protections for gig workers, right? It's not like once we want, we need an effective data privacy bills that the way, you know, you cover Wall Street, both you and Michael do, uh, you cover, they have regulations coming out their eyeballs. They don't like all of them, but sure is better than, you know, what can happen if, it, if there's none of it. And so, so we are in a situation where he gets to make all the choices because he has this unfettered access to, pretty unfettered access to people's data. I wouldn't say completely unfettered, but there's very few people except in Europe and possibly other countries that are acting upon companies like not just Facebook, but Google and Facebook are really the two, you know, market makers in advertising now. Okay, but um, what, do, what do you make though the, of, of the, and it is a freedom of speech argument, but it's also an argument that has been made in other places, which is that, that the public should see, the public deserves uh -huh. to see the way our elected officials sure. think, behave, and articulate arguments. By the way, and maybe I shouldn't be going there, you know, oh. this is an argument that you know, has been made in the past 24 hours. It's, 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 there's a public the debate going on right now at the New York yeah. Times, or around yeah. the New York Times, around this decision to publish this, this Tom Cotton piece uh, saying, send in the troops. And yeah. James Bennett, who is a colleague and a friend, and somebody who I think comes to his views honestly in good faith, he does. Uh, you know, has said that his, from his perspective, and you can agree or disagree with it, is that he published that piece because he says that that readers need to see counter arguments, particularly those made by people in position to set policy. And as, as sure. painful and dangerous as they may very well be, um, they, they deserve public scrutiny and debate. Well, here, here the problem, I disagree with him. I've done it publicly, so has Charlie Wurzel, so has Jamel Bowie, and some others. And obviously a lot of the news side has been really up in arms about it, um, which is, I think is fine. You know, I mean, there's this whole idea you can't say anything. I don't, I don't agree with it. Um, but I think it's good for the debate to happen. Um, I do think in the Tom Cotton spa space, we, they kind of cleaned him up in that piece. It was full of errors that the New York Times itself had reported were errors. And so it was without any kind of fact checking, by the way, in that it seemed like it. There was a lot of mm. as many reports. But secondly, it didn't put into context the fact that over on Twitter, where he gets to do anything he wants, he was calling for no quarter used against these protesters, which he left out of the 
New York Times piece. Like, right. so he's over here doing his dirty work on Twitter and then just looking relatively clean in the Times and somewhat reasonable when actually it should have been shown, there should have been a link saying in on Twitter, he also right. said, shoot the protesters, the two military. So it didn't, that's, I think that's the issue. You wouldn't have a, I think one person made a super good remark. You wouldn't have a piece saying, let's make the, I think it was Jen Gunter, let's make the argument for cancer to control populations. Let's do that. Let's discuss that. Or let's make the argument for um, slavery. Like let's, it's just unheard of that you would, that you would not have uh, all the facts in there for him. And I think that's one of the issues. And also this is not, this is someone who over somewhere else was doing something much more right. dangerous. And so that's the problem here. I think that's really the problem is it wasn't the full Tom Cotton. Right. Right. Well, let me, let me bring you back to the context, though, of Facebook, which is to say, is your view that these things should be Fact unpublished? They no. Should, they should include notes on them. They should be hidden and you have to press a button to see them. What do you think the right it approach depends. is? It depends. I think you can make examples of high profile users like that. I mean, Don Rump's been able to do anything he wants. And I do. And, you know, they did do it with Alex Jones. Like for them to say we don't do it is just I'm exhausted because they do it every day. Someone literally put up Trump's tweets on Twitter exactly. And they were sus exactly Trump's tweets and they suspended it in 12 hours. They suspended it in 12 hours. Every, they just, it's just amazing. Like you can, that's the, that's the problem is they don't have, they're not consistent. And I don't want to leave Twitter out because I think they took a long time. I think there's not, you can see Donald Trump's tweets on Twitter. They did not take them down. They put a fact check on them, which is linking right. them like in mail-in ballots. Look, what he's saying is, look, here's some, you know, legit, including New York Times reporting, legitimate sources that, and then it's like, you can debate the sources. I, come on, at some point it's, it, you know, we're not debating what 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 facts are it's not well we are and that's unfortunate um but you have to like you can you can put fact checks and in some cases when something does incite violence which is right in their rules by the way it's right in their rules and it's, it's very specific in the case some of them are sort of edge cases mm -hmm. or problematic cases uh but you you cover it and you say this incites violence click here you can look at it it didn't right. stop people from seeing it just said under our rules, this is a problem, but they didn't, that, if anybody else tweeted that, it would be down in seconds, the person would be suspended. In this case, he just gets, you might want to know this breaks our rules. And, and you know, that's why Donald Trump is having such a, you know, a tantrum. They, what I said in the column is they've been feeding him sugar his whole life and he's diabetic and screaming and they're wondering why, you know what I mean? And now he doesn't get to have more sugar. Well, what happens? I mean, you have children, you know. Why do you think that advertisers, why do you think consumers... Uh, why do you think that the public, to the degree that they're upset, if you believe that they really are about this know. issue, and it's not just an issue that's being talked about in a bubble among elites, but if you believe it really is widespread, why aren't they walking away from this company or using their own voice against it? There's no other game in town. There's no other game in town. There's no other game but Google. There's no other game but Amazon. There's no other game. They have they have solidified control. And after this pandemic, they're going to really solidify control. That's one thing. By the way, I don't think everyone was rank going, let's get seatbelts, right? There's a point where you don't get to like, it's for, it's for the public good in a lot of ways. And you can debate what the public good is. But I don't think everyone was wrangling about uh, cigarettes necessarily until active, active people, uh, you know, really did prove it. And boy, as it turned out, those cigarette companies were lying. What a surprise prize, right? And so I think like there was a really good, uh, I'll use another publication, the Wall Street Journal piece about the debate within Facebook of that studies that show they, they know they, they know what they're doing. They know it's unhealthy and they can then make a choice. So my, I, you know, I don't agree with, with the president's e executive order about uh, section 230. Like I thought, I thought it was a slapdash way to deal with it, to deal with retaliatory slapdash as usual, you know, thin, uh, thinly argued uh, thing about removing section 230 it was done in retaliation and it's never good legislation. And I don't agree with J Josh Hawley's way of doing it, of like repealing it, but we have to look at liability. That's all also a good way to get people to 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 get into line they you you have liability andrew i have liability chemical companies have liability wall street has liability tech companies do not have liability uh, that that that's going to create some different behaviors if they had some liability i don't know what the answer is i don't think mm. repealing it is correct but i think we should have a false a, a big debate on it a full debate on it in this country. um i want to pick up on something else you just said and, and maybe it's going to pivot the conversation and by the way we're getting you know questions are just streaming sure. in and uh -huh. i would encourage more to come in and i know michael's going to get to them and we'll bring them 
to sure. everybody in just a minute so you can have at Carrie yourself. Yeah, but, please. <laughs> uh, but, but the question I'd ask you is, you talked about the big getting bigger and Facebook, of course, getting bigger as a, as a function of this pandemic. Uh, that's also clearly the case, at least when mm -hmm. it comes to the valuations of companies uh, like, a, like an Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, like so many others. You know, you've often talked about the, uh, the concentration in this space. Are you of the view that, that we're getting to a place where you would actually break them up? You know, I don't know that solutions, I am of the view that they are going to get bigger after, the, you know, I've talked a lot about it on our Pivot podcast with Scott Galloway and a mm -hmm. lot of places. Is, and I think I wrote a whole column about it. These are, yep. the, at the beginning of the pandemic, I said, you know what's going to happen here? All these smaller companies are going to get washed away. The herd is going to get culled and these big companies are going to run into the breach. And of course they are. They've got the, they've got Midas-like money. They've got power. They've got lobbyists. They've got, they got everything you need to, you know, they got all the food, you know, they're, they're pandemically prepared to deal with it. And even Amazon is spending billions sort of virus proofing its distribution system, right? They're virus hardened, really. That's what they're doing. Um, and so they'll come out of this with so much power and so much ability. And by the way, people use the service, people who didn't use Prime, for example, they're going to be bigger, all of them. And so the question is, what does that mean? Because then there'll be only one or two choices. And listen, there's never, think about the last time there was a search service created. You can't think of one, Andrew. It was, it was DuckDuckGo, 1%. When's the last time a social media company started? Snapchat which by the way, Facebook plunders all the time for ideas, right? So that was not 2011. When's the last time there was a big e-commerce operation? Not in a while and even Walmart can't keep up, right? That was used to be the big bad bear, but, you know, big bad wolf of the whole situation. But you know, there's just no innovation here. And so small companies get either washed away or bought up and which the FTC is looking at these small company acquisitions, they get killed off. Or, or there's no opportunity for anyone to break through. And you know this, you talk to VCs, they are not gonna invest in search, they're not gonna invest in commerce, they're not gonna invest in social media. So this is, this is who we got. So I don't know what the, I think a combination of fines, really substantive fines, not these parking tickets they give these companies, uh, legislation, smart legislation around privacy and their business plan, level of liability and possibly antitrust. I don't, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know, but I certainly needs to be looked at. Well, let me ask you this, before this call, you made a, another provocative comment to me about the fact that Amazon just um, refinanced a lot of its yeah. debt and uh, sure you, you have a view about what's about to happen. They're gonna buy something, or I suppose. They need the money to expand, they're, they're ready to go. They want, they want their, they want money is money is power and they need, and it's cheap, right? It's free money essentially for Amazon. I mean, I, I'm not an expert. Again, you are much more, uh, you can look at what's happening here, but it looks like a pretty good deal for, for Amazon. So why not take it to be ready to do what they're going to do, whether it's to virus harden the company or start to buy things like, which would make sense. You know, there's some, we have predicted on pivot that maybe they'll buy JC Penney. That's an interesting that's not, and not even buy, it's just grab the scraps of it, the, the, the stores right. for warehouse and stuff like that. It's not even buying, they, don't, they get rid of the brand in two seconds, but they've got some brands, they've got some jeans, they've got some, you know, they've got some really good businesses there uh, of their own uh, private label stuff. Uh, they could, uh, JCPenney was, was one that Scott talked about. And I think that's, he's dead on about that. Um, but they, they, they're getting ready for the cleanup and right. they will be well positioned and Okay, I, that's what I do if I were Jeff Bezos, but wow. Like, okay, so here's the question. More love or more hate post-pandemic for these companies? And, I, and the reason I mention it is I think a lot about post-financial crisis, of mm -hmm. course, yeah. uh, where you know Occupy Wall Street uh, reigned sure. and, and there was lots of uh, consternation and criticism of Wall Street, in large part because Wall Street plundered the economy into this near abyss and then made money on the other end. In this instance, it's a bit more of a natural disaster with some man-made yeah. mistakes in Washington along the way. But, mm -hmm. but the issue here is that Amazon has become a huge beneficiary yes. in part because the government shut down every other company in America. Yeah. And so the question that I wonder and about Walmart, is- by, on Walmart, And Walmart, by the way. And yeah. so there's part of there, but there, there are some Americans who I think look at that and go, wow, these are truly essential companies. They did a great service for me and my family throughout this pandemic and I love them. And then mm -hmm. I think there are other people, especially small business owners who yes. haven't been allowed to be open this whole time. Absolutely. Who are looking and going, this is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs yeah. and we have a problem here. I, I'm with them. I, I have to say, I, and I use Amazon a lot. It's sort of sort of a devil's bargain, right? It's not, I think a lot of people have become, this has been, I hate to call it a marketing opportunity for Prime, but it really is, right? It's been like now people who didn't use it are like, oh, this is good. You know, uh, my girlfriend hates Amazon, but has been using Amazon. Like it's like, it's a weird situation.
information. Um, and so I think they're going to come out good in some ways, but there still is the sort of sneaking suspicion that 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 they're that once you see all these open st these storefronts and everything else, there is people will see the the bright line between them or some line between them. Um, and it depends on who's in office, right? It depends. You know, there's some there's a lot of acrimony between the Trump administration and Amazon. Uh, but at that said, uh, the idea of say you know, Vice President Elizabeth Warren, all of tech quakes about that idea, or, or Treasury right. Secretary Elizabeth Warren, or any Elizabeth Warren with even more power. I think she's, uh, she's there. You know, Mark Zuckerberg called incredibly, which I thought, again, was sort of nonsense, called her his, the existential threat, which was, I was like, not climate change, not death, not, <laughs> I could think of 10 other existential threats to our planet. Um, and it was Elizabeth Warren, which was fascinating to me. Um, so I think that Vice President Elizabeth Warren is scary to a lot of Silicon Valley, for sure. Okay, uh, I have one final question before we open it up and keep sending your questions in. I, I can literally see them sure. uh, passing along the screen here. Um, but, you know, as we get to this election in November and we uh, get to conventions, some of which may feel virtual, some may be in reality, who has the upper hand in a social media remote first world? Uh, it depends on what they do. You know, they all rushed in to try to copy Zoom. Zoom, is a, Zoom has issues around privacy and security, but they have a, they have a frictionless and very easy to use product. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if everyone's going to work from home. I'm still, I'm not of the... Oh, I think no, no, no. Of, I'm in candidate. I want to know yeah. from you politically, who do you think, in, oh. in, a social, in, a, in a remote first world where you can only get to people and you don't have the mm. same kind of access to media that you did before, you would you would you would naturally think that it would bode oh, well for, for for President Trump because of his no. audience on Twitter. However, I wonder whether no. that's a head fake. No, I think it's bad. I think he's done this whole like the march to the to the church when Oliver social media. He did not do well on that. I know he's trying to play to his base, but more people I think were sort of like ew. You know, I, you see more. The more you see of Donald Trump, the less good. I think he's you're seeing too much of him actually, especially with all those. Um, those, those, uh, he, the, the press conferences that he was doing. I think at some point it becomes too much and then you sort of like, I don't like that guy. I'm watching a lot of my Trumpy relatives be like, he needs to shut up kind of thing. So I don't necessarily, I think the basement thing's working for, for Biden actually. Everyone's like, oh, he's in the basement. I'm like, yeah, but his numbers keep going up because I think sometimes we don't want to see so much. And I think he's made some judicious grabs for attention in terms of, uh, not grabs, typical things. He's visited the churches. Uh, I think he could be more outspoken, but why, when someone's tripping over, you know, when someone's right. tripping over themselves, why not just let them, let them? Okay. I don't know. Um, I've, we've got so He's not questions. good, by the way, he's not great on digital. <laughs> let me just be clear. He's not particularly Well, I, I'm, I, 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 when, as you were speaking, I wrote down the basement is working for Biden. So that, yeah. may, be, that, that may be the quote of the day. <laughs> the um, let me hand it over to Michael, who I know has more questions than we have time, but uh, we should definitely get to as many as we sure. possibly Whatever can. Sure, whatever you Michael. want. Great. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, this has been a lively discussion. Uh, Kara, I had one question for you, which is, sure. um, we've talked a lot about sort of the power that these companies have over, like, say, the um, public discourse. But I'm curious about what's happening with um, possibly holding them to account with how they treat workers. You know, we've oh, seen yeah. a lot of discussion about Amazon warehouse workers, gig economy, and how they're treating their workers. Um, are they so powerful now that it's too hard to bring them to heel, given what they're doing, fighting the California law, et cetera? It depends on what worker you are, doesn't it? If you're one of the knowledge workers, you have a lot of power. I mean, there's been a little bit of a back and forth at Facebook, obviously Google walkout and things like that. But I think we're talking about contract workers, which of which these companies hire a lot, like, right? That's their little trick to hire these people and not give them the kind of benefits. I do think after this pandemic, there's gonna there's a real opportunity for unions and others to like step up and say, we cannot, it cannot be a situation of lords and serfs in this country. And that's what it's become. And we're missing the disconnect between the stock market and the main street economy. And I think people, this has shown more than anything else, this pandemic, that people are very vulnerable around healthcare, around day-to-day -day living, that they're not making a living wage, that these companies have, have, have benefited off their backs. 
Um, and so have consumers, by the way. You know, when you take a, a, an Uber ride and it's four dollars, and you go, "Yay!" It's not yay. You're, someone is paying somewhere along the line, and it's not you. And so, you know, they're doing it to get you as a customer, to get your name, to get your credit card, and things like that. So you're being used in some way. But boy, are these workers being used in ways that uh, benefit the wealthy and do not benefit them. And so we need to think about uh, all kinds of uh, benefits and how to do it. It's it's. I had an interesting conversation with Gavin Newsom, who's governor of California, and, and a long time ago, before he was governor, about how the need to change what an employee is and what it means in society. And I think it's a bigger discussion. You know, you don't have to stick Medicare for all on top of it to say that everyone deserves affordable uh, health care, that everyone deserves. And you can debate the way you're going to do it, but everyone does deserve it. Everyone deserves a, a living wage. Everyone deserves to be able to spend time with their kids. Um, and I do think people who have more means, like you and I and Andrew, um, are even like having no childcare for a short time. It's like, what? What is this? What? This is hard. And you know, this is how most people live every day. And we have to start thinking about those workers. So yes, I think there's going to be a big movement. There's a real opportunity for sure. All right, got it. Now, um, Andrew's right, we have so many questions and we wish we could get to them all. Um, this one I'm gonna throw out to you and to Andrew. Jenny asks, um, basically, what sort of role does Wall Street, um, what sort of responsibility do they have in creating this, this situation? Um, you know, like a lot of these companies went public and they have these um, super voting shares, et cetera. So, um, you know, how much of the blame can be placed on Wall Street? and here, and, and sort of in a related question, Noreen, who emailed this question, asked, what can and should investors be doing to put pressure to try to change these companies? Oh, I can start. I think it's not Wall Street's fault. They, this is what they do. They take companies public. I think they allow these companies. They're not the ones to decide whether to allow Mark Zuckerberg to have full control of these companies. I think it starts with VCs, I would think, early, much earlier on that give enormous power to these founders. Um, I, do, I did a column about this idea of these sort of perpetual CEOs with these, with these voting shares that allow them to uh, control things. I, I think Mark Zuckerberg's grandchildren will be able to control Facebook. Like, you know, it's really, um, nobody has this kind of power. And it, some people think it should stop after seven years or it's done in order to protect the companies as they're growing. That's the argument. After a while, it gets somewhat ridiculous. There's no accountability. Andrew? I would just throw in, I think she's 100% right. You know, Kara's 100% right. Uh, it starts at the womb for these companies. And that means it starts with the venture capitalists who uh, just allow this to take place. I'm surprised that the private market investor or the public market investors, I should say, have not pushed back more on this so that when we do have IPOs, they don't try to put in these so-called sunset provisions. Like Kara was mentioning this idea that maybe after seven years or 10 years or some period of time, um, these things get loosened up, but I, I do fault to the degree you want to fault them, uh, the investment community, uh, more than the Wall Street bankers themselves, uh, because there is an, an element of greed. And I think there's a lot of people who put blinders on or look the other way and say, you know what, I I'm willing to go along with this governance structure. I may not like it, but I think these people are going to make me money and I'll do it that way. And so that's where we are. And that's what's happening right now. Yeah. Facebook is at an all time high. There's, you know, they're, they're, they're complaining all the way to the bank. I just don't, I, I don't expect Wall Street to behave any differently. I, I, I don't think that's even cynical. That's what they do, right? Got it. And, and I personally have a follow-up question, which is there's been a lot of talk in the business community about sort of changing the definition of who companies serve, right? Like mm -hmm. it's not just about serving shareholders, it's about bigger stakeholders. Sure. And a lot of these tech companies say that, you know, they seem to espouse very progressive ideas, but where do they fall on that spectrum? in terms of like actually supporting bigger communities. The, with, with the shareholders, I mean, a lot of people are talking about it. Mark Benioff is talking about compassionate capitalism. There's a lot of people in tech who, and people, especially the workers, the, the knowledge workers, down from the CEOs. I think they're uh, very much uh, thinking about that idea of what, who are our stakeholders here? Is it just shareholders? Is it our employees, which is another stakeholder? Is it, uh, is it some s social good? Is there some level of social good? Um, you know, there's, there, you can have a long debate about that, um, you know, sort of thank you, Mil Milton Friedman kind of thing. But I think the idea that shareholders are the only stakeholders is, is the grip is loosening. I don't know, Andrew, what do you think? I think the grip's loosening a, a bit, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, 
I, I could go all, all different directions on this, mm -hmm. and I know there's so many other questions. So, I'll, uh, Michael, I'll I'll, okay. I'll 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 punt only only on behalf of <laughs> the enough. listeners. That's fair enough. Um, so we have a couple of interesting anonymous questions, including someone who says that. Uh, this person is an employee for one of the companies we've been talking okay. about. And these questions are on what sort of changes should happen to these companies? Should they become public benefit companies or public utility companies? Would that help in terms of changing the, the power or, or uh, just sort of putting in the sort of overhauls that people seem to want here? Uh, no, I don't think so. You know, it's interesting because when I first met Mark, the first talk we ever had, he, he, walk, he walks around places often with his shoes off, but um, he used to, I don't know if he still does that. Um, he talked about, he described Facebook and I remember it was very striking as utility, you know, and he was trying to differentiate himself from the, you know, the ongoing club that was going on over at MySpace that was more popular at the time and which was a fun time kind of place, you know? And so uh, he thought of it as a utility back then. I do not think it should be. I just think it should be subject to um, more regulation and not a lot. I don't want to like, you know, they always make the argument, oh, if you have any regulation, it's going to stifle innovation. I think that's just not true. Um, but they do, liability, it seems to me to be the way to, to correct this. If they have some liability, uh, they certainly would behave differently as we all do. Do you, by the way, can I just follow, if they do have liability, you know, there is an argument to be made on the other end, which is that they'd censor basically, not everything, yeah. but they'd censor a that lot, would. a lot, a lot, a lot of yeah, stuff. Yeah, they would. They would. Yeah, they would. That is, that is an argument. But are they the public square, Andrew? They're not. They're actually not. They're private companies owned by the richest people in the history of the planet, uh, grabbing your data and doing what they want with it. So I don't, I, they're not the public square. I don't, I, I think the, my... Anyone worse than them is the government stepping in and deciding this kind of stuff. Uh, so I don't think, you know, someone wrote here, the founders didn't envision social media. They certainly didn't. They certainly didn't. But I know what they wrote. They didn't say a Facebook shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. They said Congress shall make no law. So that was kind of specific. Got it. Uh, we have another anonymous question asking, uh, what do you think it will take for Mark Zuckerberg to reverse his positions? You know, we, we've seen employees um, go increasingly public in their, their opposition to his policies. And he seems to have stuck to his guns. So then yeah. what would it take to make a move? Uh, better friends? I don't know. Uh, I don't think he will. I don't think he will. I think he's very, he does everything on a data basis. He, he said he, was, he did all this research. I don't, but of course he didn't tell us who he talked to. It'd be good to know who he's getting his influences from. Um, you know, he's someone very curiously, and I think Andrew knows this, that really seeks out knowledge and data and information. He's like, I, I was recalling it when he did this 6,000 word essay on the community when mm -hmm. there was all kinds of problems around. I, I can't remember what the, there's always a controversy at Facebook. And I think this was over Tiananmen Square or something like, so he ran across Tiananmen Square. I, I don't recall what the crisis was at the time, but it was another similar kind of crisis. And he wrote this 6,000 word essay and he actually called like a lot of reporters and wanted to talk about it quite a lot. Like, it's, cause he didn't go to finish college. I felt like he kind of has such a, a thirst for knowledge. Um, and he talked to, we talked for a long time late into the night about this essay. And he goes, initially he said, what do you think? And I said, it's a lot of words, Mark. And like, you need some editors, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, but nobody edits him. So that's the problem. He doesn't have any editor. He doesn't have any other, he just takes an information and then it depends on who's giving it to him, I guess. So I don't know, different influences, different, he tried the walk across America and getting on tractors thing, if you recall when he did that. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think he will change his mind. But I think do, he's, do I you believe his view is, do you believe his view is principled insofar as he believes in it, or do you believe it's political on behalf of the company or, or that, I mean, yeah. I, I think that's people, a fundamental question. People people speculate, obviously, but I, I yeah, people call him the devil. They call him the. I think he's quite earnest and thoughtful. I just think he's wrong. That's different. You, you know what I mean? I don't think he. I don't think it's about the money with him, as other people say. I don't think that. I don't. I don't. I've never had that impression from him. I mean, maybe he's tricking me or gaming me or whatever. But I think I. I don't know. Maybe. A, a, a very high level person, a whole bunch of early Facebook people laid into him for sure. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know what would, I think he thinks he's right. And he's got right. some people around him like Joel Kaplan, who's, who's been trying to move him closer to the Trump administration and, and Peter Thiel. And I just don't know their influence on him or Mark, uh, uh, um, Mark, Mark Andreessen. Andreessen right. Yeah. And uh, look, look who left the, who, look who left the board. 
people I think a lot of, Reed Hastings, Erskine Bowles, uh, Kenneth, Ken Chenault, right. they didn't leave just because they, why would you leave the most powerful company on the, in the world's board? I, I, that's just some. There are people that left say a lot to me. It says right. a lot to me of who left. I have great respect for all the people who left. Got it. Um, so Bruce asks an interesting question, um, which is, you know, there's a lot of hand wringing about, um, you know, Facebook's impact and the impact of its policies, but it doesn't seem to be translating to a sort of mass deleting of accounts. So no. what would it take for people to actually leave the platform? Like, what would it take for you, Kara, to lead, to delete your account? I don't use the platform. I use Instagram sometimes. I'm thinking of actually deleting it now because I just should should walk the talk essentially. I don't I don't find it useful, but everybody else does. It's incredibly useful. It's a good product. I mean, it also takes other people's ideas almost persistently. It's really kind of amazing what shoplifters, the Facebook people are of other people's ideas. Um, but uh, I think uh, I I I I, sh I don't use it that much. I don't use their platform. I'm worried about. I don't. I, you know, I turn off all my location settings on everything on Google and everything else. So I'm different than most people. I think most people. It's like what I tend to call them. Call people. Uh, unfortunately, we have to look at consumers here. We really do in terms of what they're using. Um, is they they're like cheap dates. I call it. They're people are cheap dates to these tech companies. They take all our information. They monetize it. They become billionaires, and we get a free dating app. Thanks. We get a map. We get a you know, we get to write messages between each other. We're such cheap dates and we put up with so much for so little given how much benefit they're getting from us. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a product that works and I don't know people, I don't know what, what happened with, I, I'm not smart enough to know what happened with cigarettes. When, why did people stop using them? Why did people stop doing, you know, putting car, you know, I think unsafe at any speed was a big thing around cars. Uh, why do people, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I honestly don't. Got it. Um, so Phil asks uh, about um, sort of social media, uh, you know, the, the, these platforms algorithms sort of put people in their own bubbles. Should there be uh, any sort of action taken to, to seed each user's feed with content that, you know, represents opposing views yeah. sort of challenging their, their little bubbles? Yeah, Mark talked about that. Has talked way back when in that essay he talked about that. I'm sort of uh, breaking the bubbles, but they kind of haven't. Um, I think what happens is there's also a social element to it, a real human social element. I had a friend who has a lived, grew up in a small town in Indiana, and she there's a group for them, you know, that they talk about things in the town and things like that. And she stays on it. She lives here in D.C. And uh, she said they suddenly started to say there were going to be caravans of, uh, of African American people coming down and rioting in their small town in Indiana, which was untrue. And they're like, get in your homes. They were all doing this whole thing on Facebook, these groups, which I think are really where a lot of the problem is, where a lot of the, the, the stuff happens. And it was, it was seeded by bad content from other you know, people trying to make trouble, like the Russians and others. And they completely believe it. She's like, there are no caravans coming to get you. You know what I mean? And they're like, yes, there are. Get off of this. You know, just was, we're attacking her. And it was, and of course today she's like, how are those caravans doing? Are they there yet? You know, like it, it's just crazy. And what happens is I, I did a great podcast with some people who are studying this stuff. This, this misinformation is not about advertising really. It's about content. They put up content that has New York Times font on it or BBC font and put out all kinds of wacky stories that then get, shared and then you don't see the wacky stuff right and so that's you don't know what's happening and if there's a crazy ad on television like the Barry Goldwater ad uh, I mean the one against Barry Goldwater everybody sees it at the same time and can con in this case a million different lies are being sent to a million different people and so it'll be really hard to understand what influences them Got it. Okay, and that is, I uh, wish we had more time, but Andrew, I'll toss it back to you. Well, thank you, uh, Michael, thank you. Thank you guys, everybody, for all your questions. I have one, great final, I have one final question for Kara. Okay. Um, which is, you spent a lot of time with people in the Valley, um, and frankly, people across the country, all of whom mm -hmm. are uh, hopefully thoughtful. But I was curious if there's somebody that we don't know um, or that it may be underrepresented that we should be following, if you will. Give us a, give us a follow. Somebody, um, meaning you don't know so, of? Well, either somebody we don't know of, but that, that's a smart follow. So somebody that you think right now is really, huh. is really talking in a smart way about these issues that you, that you find has educated you and is, and is thoughtful. I will tell you, I was really 
uh, impressed recently by the Evan Spiegel essay yeah. uh, in the yeah. past two days. Yeah, he's um, great. I think he often doesn't get get enough credit. I know you you've written a lot about Mark Benioff, who I think has been quite outspoken. But I just didn't know if there were people uh, in the netherworld, if you will, that that haven't necessarily reached those heights yet, but but are right. either on Twitter or, or that you interact with in other ways. Yeah, uh, there's a few people. Should, be there's, thinking about. there's a few people I really like. Obviously, I think Mark is interesting all the time. He's always, you know, I like Mark Cuban. I just did a great podcast with him. I think Brian Chesky's a really interesting character in Silicon Valley. He's well known, but I, I just did a podcast with him and it's a very thoughtful thing. He's, his business has really gotten hit and how he dealt with it and dealing with it was really, and he was quite raw about it in a way that I thought was really helpful. Um, and Airbnb has been controversial in lots of places. He addressed that too. He addresses things, which is a real pleasure to talk to someone who does that. Um, I think um, I really like a couple of people. Nicole Wong, you don't know who she is. She's, she used to be a lawyer at Twitter and Google. I think she's incredibly thoughtful about this legal stuff around it. She was right in the middle of it. Um, and I do, I'm always like interested. I always text her when there's things like this because I think she, she and she has, she's on Twitter. I think it's at Nicole Wong. Um, I always found her to be super, like I didn't think of things in the same way. I'd say uh, Shoshana Zuboff was someone I talked to very early about, um, about a lot of stuff about surveillance capitalism. I thought she was on that super early and continues to be a really interesting, uh, you know, thinker on those topics. Um, okay. Uh, and I, I would, I would listen. I would listen to, even though you, you may not like him. I don't, I don't like a lot of things he says. I do think uh, Josh Hawley's interesting, at least when he's not down, you know, the the, the alley of of companies, uh, you know, being uh, anti-conservative bias. Mm -hmm. I think he's interesting. Um, I think um, I'm trying to think of someone who's who's young. There's so many great voices. Sarah Cooper. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyone who has not availed themselves to Sarah Cooper's brilliance, she was a, I did a great podcast with her and Dick Costlow. She was a former Google product manager and now she's like a star. Uh, she's using these mediums in ways that I think are really interesting to watch. The Times did a great piece on her uh, and she's really, she does, she has a really great Twitter feed that's also really smart beyond her Trump, whatever, what, I don't know what she's doing, what you would call it, Kabuki. Uh, I don't know what it is. It's sort of a new medium of comedy. So Sarah Cooper is amazing. Well, we will look for all of them. It's actually inspiring me to think maybe we should have a section on Fridays called, uh, you know, uh, yeah. fave, fave Follows. And we'll, yeah, uh, great we'll try, idea. We'll try to put those follows in tomorrow's yeah. uh, deal book along with a replay of this. We want to thank everybody on the call. We want to thank you for your questions. Uh, we want to thank Kara uh, for her insight, Michael for, for wading through all of those questions. We also should tell you Kara's got a new podcast coming yes. now on the New York Times platform we're all very excited about. And yes. um, maybe we'll do something uh, more when when that begins, please help kick please. it off. Great. And uh, finally, for all of those out out there listening, the New York Times has a huge slate now of digital events, virtual events that we're doing um, almost every day these days. And you can find out a lot more about them by visiting timesevents.nytimes.com. In the meantime, please stay safe and healthy out there, and we hope to see you and hear you um, and talk to you all very very soon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>